The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar. I'm Jenny Bailey from the Agile Business Consortium. We're the not-for-profit member organization who are leading, promoting, and enabling business agility worldwide. Now, as with all our webinars, we're recording this broadcast, and the slides and also the, the broadcast will be available to you, um, and I'll actually send out a rec uh, the recording and the slides in an email um, after the, uh, the webinar. Um, also, we love to hear your questions. We love to keep discussions open with our webinar series. So please forward your questions or put, put your hand up um, maybe at the end of the presentation, um, and we will get to your questions if time permits. Uh, we try to get to as many as we can. And also, possibly, there's also a chance um, at the end of the presentation, once we close the broadcast, that we can actually send you more information in the follow-up. Um, so we do that also in handouts. So my guest this morning is Andrew Craddock, uh, Consortium Director, Chair of the Product Board that oversees the development and evolution of all our products. Actually, I think uh, Andrew Craddock has been a pivotal part of the DSDM Consortium, which was our name before we changed in 2016 to the Agile Business Consortium. And in all those years, he's been very heavily involved in um, looking after our product development, the evolution of the methods, um, and all the products that we bring to market. So um, he is a pivotal part of the organization, and I'm delighted uh, that he's sparing some time with us today to come and talk to us about Moscow. So welcome, Andrew. It's uh, lovely to, uh, to have you here in the meeting room and uh, joining us, because you're actually in the same office, which is really unusual, actually, for webinars. It is. I don't, I don't, spend, don't spend much time at headquarters, but I've been here for <laughs> the last couple of days. So yes, it's a pleasure. Now, you are our guru, I think, aren't you, when it comes to Moscow? Um, I know for member days, for instance, for the last three years that I've known of, um, you've been coming out to member days talking about Moscow. We've done webinars with you before about Moscow, and we've done lots of conference presentations about Moscow as well. And it's obviously been around for a number of years, um, but obviously you are an expert on it, and so I'm delighted that you've um, shared some time with us today, so thank you. Um, now, thinking about Moscow... It started back in the early 90s, I'm guessing, didn't it? And um, I've done some research, and it was started by a man called um, Di Clegg of Oracle. Now, um, Oracle was obviously one of those organizations that um, helped us form the consortium. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And, uh, and another one of those organizations was British Airways, and it was uh, actually at British Airways back in 1997 that, uh, that I first came across, uh, first came across Moscow. Um, at that time, um, I was a project manager. Um, I'd been running projects for uh, several years, and all of my projects were coming in late and over budget, um, at least against the original planned uh, timescales and, uh, and, and budgets. Um, and it was the normal. It wasn't just me. All the projects in British Airways that involved IT uh, were following very much that same pattern. Um, and when Moscow uh, was introduced, and when DSDM was introduced, actually, which is the uh, um, the approach that first brought Moscow to the world. So before that, as you say, Di Clegg uh, was responsible for, for creating it. He mm -hmm. worked for Oracle, and it was used inside Oracle. Um, the DSDM consortium at the time um, were a group of companies, including British Airways and British Telecom and um, Oracle and IBM and various other consultancy organizations who no longer exist, actually, have been wound into, uh, wound into other organizations. Um, but, yeah, those group of, group of companies got together and sort of said, how, what are the best practices? What do we find works that really helps us to deliver projects predictably? And one of the big learning things was that Oracle basically had its sussed when it came to prioritizing requirements. Wow, so, uh, so it was a, a really good addition to, uh, to the method um, to, to have Moscow prioritization as part of it. So how did you kind of connect with the method when you first heard of it? Were you, were, did you kind of think, wow, this is, this is so easy in its, in its essence? Or did you think um, there must be more to this, that there must be some governance behind it, there must be some rules and regulations? Or did you think, I get it, this is just so clever? So it was almost the exact, exact opposite of that, actually. So I'd already been, uh, been sent on different training programs to work as a project manager, different ways of working. And I really found that none of those helped me manage projects in particular. Um, they didn't really help me in the real world of getting 
uh, getting my projects delivered on time and on budget. And it actually, <laughs> my manager said to me one day, Andrew, I volunteered your next project to use to use this new approach called DSDM. And uh, and I, I wasn't at all enthusiastic, to be perfectly honest. I thought, oh, here we go again. I'm going to be sent <laughs> off on another training course to find out loads of theory that doesn't really help in the real world. Right. And there were two things, actually, that he went, went on to say. He said, yeah, first of all, we're getting the trainer to come into the organization and to, to train you and your team in how to do this. And mm -hmm. I thought, oh, well, that's different to begin with because... It's my team, so it's involving all of us rather than just me as a project manager, um, and and that that's how it that's how it started really. And I the trainer came in, and I I I'm <laughs> nobody can see this, but I'm sitting here with my arms folded, and that's exactly <laughs> what I did in the. Uh, and it was a case of okay, come on then, impress you, me. You, you, you impress me, tell, <laughs> yeah. tell me how it's going to make my life easier. And over a period of three days, um, I just thought, wow, this just makes complete sense. And everything I'm hearing is really going to help me to be more predictable around projects, to deliver on, to get projects delivered on time and on budget. Um, and Moscow was one of those key things, along with time boxing, which mm. I'll make a little bit of reference to mm, later on. Sure, absolutely. We'll come to that. Mm. Oh, well, that's interesting. That, it's really good to kind of look back and kind of see where it came from. And then obviously Dyke Leg donated it to the consortium, which was, mm. which was fantastic. Yeah. And it's gone from strength to strength. Obviously, it's been out for a number of years, as we said, and everything when it's when it's out there and it's used and it's tried, it it, it evolves, doesn't it? And it do does. you think Moscow has evolved from that from that kind of first um, sort of concept of it? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I mean, the, the the concept is is the same. We've we've refined it and and sort of enhanced the guidance to try and just make it easier for people to grasp and to uh, and to understand over the years. And as, as you say, I've been involved in the consortium over over you know the last um, 10 to 15 years. And that's one of the things, the little tweaks as we've mm. gone through the, the different versions of the method mm. um, until it's got to where it is today, which is um, which is still not finished because we've got some ideas about uh, uh, how we can apply Moscow to in, in a slightly different way to product development rather mm. than just to projects. Okay. Now, before Moscow came along, you said everything was a requirement and everything had to be done. Um, and then, obviously, the requirements came along, and it was sorry, it was prioritised, and there was there was a, a, a process put in place. But mm. before that time, everything was obviously seen as a must, wasn't it? It was, and and that was that was very much the way that. Uh, um, back in the 90s, the expectation was that you came up with a specification of re your requirements. This is what you wanted a, a system to do. And mm. there was an expectation that everything in there would be delivered. Um, so, yeah, that was there wasn't any concept really of prioritization within the requirements. Mm -hmm. Teams were just expected to get on with it and address the requirements in whatever way they thought was appropriate. And projects were still being delivered successfully, but obviously time was um, being added on to the end of it, wasn't it? It, it was. And in, in fact, yes, you did, projects were being delivered. Um, whether It depends how you measure success. Mm. You see, if yes, you, if you right. end up taking twice as long as you expected and spending double the More amount money. of money to mm. build the, of the product that you're expecting, mm -hmm. would you say that was a successful outcome? Well, it was successful in that you got something in the end. Of course. But... Did it make sense in terms of a business case? If you'd known it was going to take that long, you'd known it was going to cost that much money, mm -hmm. would you have done it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let, let's move on from the from the early beginnings, as it were, of Moscow. And mm. let, let's move into the hows, the whys, the respect for it, and uh, the challenges that it can give, really, to, mm. um, to organizations so they understand it correctly. I mean, this webinar really is, we're looking at the... The, the, the pros, the tips, and um, the myths. We're going to try and break some of those because um, there's a few myths surrounding Moscow now, yeah. isn't there? Yeah. So, okay, well, let's let's move on from that point then. So, Moscow prioritization. We really, obviously, need to um, understand it, don't mm. we? Okay. So, yeah, the, the one of the things that um, in fact, in in conversation only yesterday, people were saying, "Oh, well, we were using Moscow, but we stopped using it because it wasn't working." And I said, "Well." What do you mean it wasn't working? And the response was, well, everything, every, everybody said that everything was a must have. And people get to know that if it isn't a must have, then they're not going to get it. So, right. so should haves and could haves never got delivered. So what was the point in having them? Everything became a must have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the one of the key things is is really understanding there are certain things that are absolute 
rules that you have to follow with Moscow and other things you can be flexible with. So you need to understand it. You need to, to, to really respect those definitions of, for example, what is a must have. Mm. We'll come to that in a minute. Mm. Um, and very importantly as well, you need to be able to, to sell it to, to people. And what businesses really need is predictability. Yeah, you see lots of people banging the table and saying, I want this and it must do this and, and all of this sort of thing. And I want it now and and uh, and, and all of that sort of thing. Um, but at the end of the day, what businesses need is when am I going to get this? Yeah, mm. now, we all know you want it. That's mm. fine. But when's it going to arrive? When can you start exploiting that capability? OK. OK, well, let's um, let's just find out from everybody listening, because I know we've got people um, all over the world that have joined us this morning and it's obviously their evening, afternoon, um, morning. Um, let's just do a little poll, actually. So before you actually heard and registered for um, for this webinar, had you actually um, used Moscow? Had you heard of Moscow before? Um, so let's just do a little poll. So you'll see a little launch poll now on your system. It'll be asking you the question uh, before signing up to this webinar. So it would be really interesting if you can just um, answer that for us, just to see what the feedback is, just to know if we've got real newbies out there or whether or not we've got people that are using Moscow, um, liking Moscow, going through the process, understanding it. So if you can just uh, um, let us have your answers, we'd appreciate that. Well, it looks very clearly, doesn't it? It looks 100%. Um, <laughs> everybody out there. Um, is very much into it at the moment. We've got a few more just voting now, um, but it looks very strong, doesn't okay, it? Good. So 90% of the people have voted and they've had it before. Good. Fantastic. All right. Um, so I guess that means I'll be able to uh, to skip through some of the uh, some of the early parts of, uh, of the slides I've prepared, which is uh, which is which is a good thing, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, let's let's start with the the first the first thing. That, uh, that that we, we really really need to understand, and that is goes back to the point I was making just now about predictability. Yeah. So uh, with any projects or any uh, IT product we're building or whatever it may be, there are a number of things that uh, businesses really need to focus on, um, and they're, they're summed up in this sort of uh, this triangle with four four points to it, this pyramid and four points to it. So at the top we have the features. The features are you know, what is it we need to create? You know, what are the requirements? What features do we need to build into our product? Um, there is a consideration of how long is it going to take? So the time dimension, how much is it going to cost? Um, and a consideration around uh, the level of quality that, uh, that the solution needs to, uh, uh, needs to achieve. Hmm. So often people sort of think okay well we, we need all these things and we need it on in this time frame and we need it for this amount of money and of course it's got to be high quality um and let's nail down all of those uh all of those um uh criteria if you like in in terms of uh, uh of trying to to establish these things and the reality is that Generating a full scope to agree quality in a fixed time and for a fixed cost is just unrealistic yeah? because it requires everything to go perfectly to plan. And we all know that, uh, that plans um, always change. Yeah? The world around us is moving so fast that it's un unrealistic to expect um, to be able to say even three months ahead, mm. this is what we want exactly and it's not going to change. Mm. Yeah, uh, the rate of change is so high that change is inevitable. Okay, so we've we've understanding that. So, so how does Moscow help with this? Okay, so what we need to accept is that there needs to be flexibility in in something. Yeah, and following a traditional approach, like I was mentioning, we used back in British Airways in in the nineties. The expectation was that features were fixed, so we knew exactly what it was. In theory, we knew exactly what it was that we wanted to build. The reality is we never did. But in theory, we've got all of these features we need to build in. Um, and the reality was that the things that varied were the time and cost. So as we went through our uh, approach, building our solution, um, things would happen. Um, requirements would change. We'd find things weren't as easy as we expected or um, we find that... Uh, that certain things didn't work as expected or 
whatever. So there are always changes coming in to, uh, to, to our project. And those changes just got accepted. They might have been controlled, but inevitably they got accepted. And that led to the timescales moving out and the costs increasing. And I used to find myself going to steering committees or project boards, whatever, the governing mm. groups and saying, OK, well, this problem has arisen. Um, if you want us to finish the project, you're going to have to give us more time and more budget. OK. Um, or you can walk away and we'll call it a day. We won't we won't do any more work. And of course, everybody always said, well, we're three quarters of the way through the project. Now, of course, we're going to have to give you more money and mm. more time to do this. What DSDM did was it turned that triangle on its head. And it said, actually, when we go through our early planning, and we still do upfront planning in, uh, in using the DSDM approach, we will estimate how long it's going to take us to, to build all of these features into, uh, into our solution. And having done that estimating, we will fix the time and the cost. And what will happen is, oh, and we'll also fix quality. Um, so we will build, build our solution incrementally and uh, and we will make sure we hit hit the quality criteria as we go through. But if those things happen, if things change, if somebody was to come along and say, I did this requirement has changed, we say, OK, well, that's fine. We can accommodate that change. Yeah. But in order to fit that in, that mm. new requirement or whatever mm. it might be, um, we're going to have to sacrifice something. We're going to have to take something that's less important and leave that out. Yeah. So. Uh, so that gives us uh, sort of two things to uh, to consider. One is we want to work using time boxes. Now, some DSDM calls these time boxes for people using Scrum. They're yeah. called sprints. Mm -hmm. um, some people call them iterations. It's the same idea. It's a, f a short, fixed period of time where we'll deliver something of value. So what we do is we focus on delivering something of value in a couple of weeks not necessarily put live, but actually delivered and, and ready to go live, at least. Um, and then we'll move on to the next chunk of things to do. At any point, if some, and we'll, and we'll work in a priority order, we'll work on the most important things first, usually. At that point, if anybody, if any change happens, or it's a case of, oh, well, that's been built now, but the world has moved on, we need to change it. It's always a case of, okay, we can do that. Um, what of less importance that we haven't done any work on yet can be left out to make room for that. Okay. And we use Moscow prioritization to prioritize those features. So <clears throat> the key to this and the key to making this a success is to make sure that the business is in the driving seat of that prioritization. So um, this is, I mentioned on that very first slide, the idea we need to be able to sell this concept typically to business people. And one of the ways you sell it is to say the business is in the driving seat. Mm. Yeah. If, if, you, if you business people have a new requirement, then that's great. We can deal with it. But you also need to choose which of these less important things can be left out. And typically uh, finding early on at least, finding things that aren't so important is, mm. uh, is relatively easy, particularly if you've Moscow prioritised these things. So the key is that we focus on the business need. We understand at the outset of our project what it is we're trying to achieve. So we're looking at a level much higher than the requirements. What is it as a business we want to achieve during this just project or, or building this product um, and have that clarity? Once we know what it is we're trying to achieve, then we can prioritize the things that we might want to do against achieving what it is we want to achieve, achieving that vision. And what we find is that in, in achieving a big objective, um, normally we can get 80% of what we're trying to achieve from just doing 20% of the possible work. That's a, the Pareto principle the, or the 80-20 rule. Um, which was actually a, an original observation that goes back to 1906 um, wow. in, uh, in Italy. Uh, uh, but an observation that 80% of the wealth was held by 20% of the population. That's where the Pareto principle came from. It's been used in very different ways since then. <laughs> um, so we should always think about business value and the overall business value. 
and um, we should try and make sure that overrides local interest. So very often what we see is we see different stakeholders with their own requirements and they're all, everybody thinks their requirements are the most important. Mm. Um, actually, if we think about it collectively, say, no, no, not the most important thing to you, yes, we need to understand that, but what's the most important thing to the business? And actually, if you're able to sort of elevate your thinking back to that business vision level, it makes prioritization of requirements more effective in groups. So we prioritize early to help shape our budgets and plans, as I described earlier. Um, we prioritize often um, because we need to, because the world around us changes and, uh, and we need to value responding to those changes over following our original plan. Because if we just followed our original plan, we'd get to the end of the project and we'd have built something that yeah, might have been what yeah. people thought they wanted at the beginning, but mm. doesn't match their real world needs now. We also prioritise in different time frames as well. Uh, and uh, so we would look at saying, OK, overall, for this particular release of our, um, our product or our increment of our project, what is it we want to achieve? Um, and we can Mosto prioritize that. So we might have something there. We have a, um, um, a, a requirement that by the time we go live with this, we must be in place. Mm. OK, fair enough. Mm. But do we have to have that delivered in the first time box or the first sprint? Quite often the answer is no. You know, it doesn't matter if that comes in sprint three or sprint four. That's fine as long as it's there before we go live with this thing. Mm -hmm. So actually, we can use a different use Moscow again at a lower level for a sprint. And we say, OK, so for the, for the overall increment of the overall delivery, this is a must have. But is it a must have for the first sprint? No, it isn't. It might be a should have or a could have. And we'll talk about the definitions of those in a minute. OK, okay. we have to be proactive in uh, in our prioritization. Um, and people shouldn't be afraid to challenge priorities at any point. One of the things that emerged in the 1990s, and I've experienced this at British Airways and, and with lots of organisations I've worked with, is back then in the 90s, the concept of the customer was introduced. Yeah? And, uh, and unfortunately, it tended to follow the archetypal retail type customer right. you know, and they said the customer is always, customer is always, always right, right. Yeah. yeah and that works if you're going to buy a pair of shoes yes, yeah you sure. know exactly what shoes you want and if those shoes aren't it you don't buy them you go <laughs> you go somewhere else um but that doesn't really work so well in uh in uh when you're talking about it systems and and business changes and that mm. sort of thing it's much more about you know everybody having an opinion and i remember having quite a heated argument with a customer in inverted commas at British Airways and he said well this is my business and 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 I want it and I said no no it's not your business it's our business I'm employed by British Airways I'm as much of a stakeholder of in British Airways as you are yeah. I have an opinion mm -hmm. you know and and that is right you know that sort of challenge is the right thing to do yeah so who won uh, that argument um I think that particular one I won. <laughs> most, most of them, it's fair to say, he won because they were specific business right. things. Right. And uh, and if he could say, well, look, it's really important because, and explain it, absolutely. fantastic. I challenge, he responds. Exactly. It's that's the what right it's thing all about, do. isn't it? It's, that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. It's that collaboration in getting it right. Okay, so... Uh, so um, Moving on, moving on again, then one of the things that I, I mentioned was, you know, this idea that everything's a must have and, and, mm. and we can't. Uh, uh, therefore, prioritization is, is pointless. Well, DSDM has very specific definitions of what a must have is. And typically. No, I won't say, I won't say typically, I'll say every single time. Every single time I've worked with people around Moscow where everything starts off as a must have, um, the, answer, the answer is no, they're not. They're exactly. genuinely not must haves yeah. by the definition that I'm about to, uh, mm. about to describe. So uh, first thing to, to understand in terms of prioritization is what's in scope of what we're doing and what's out of scope. So what things are we focusing on and what aren't we focusing on at the moment? Yeah. So uh, so. Um, Within the things that are in scope for now, and the things that are out of scope aren't things that are always going to be out of scope. They're just out of scope for now. We're mm -hmm. not thinking about it at this point. Mm -hmm. But the things that are in scope, we've got um, 
three categories, the must-haves, the should-haves, and the could-haves, the M, S, and C of Moscow. The uh, out-of-scope things are the won't-have this times, which is the W. Okay. So in terms of the must-haves, there is a, uh, a, a definition uh, associated with that that says a must-have requirement is something that if it isn't there, the solution we're creating will be unusable, completely unusable, mm -hmm. unsafe, mm -hmm. or illegal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And those are the only definitions of a must-have. doesn't matter what business value it has. doesn't matter how important you think it is. If it's still usable, safe, and legal, it's okay. Right, yeah? okay. So, so what we say there is, uh, a, a rule is, if... You ask the question, if we can't meet that one requirement, mm. we need to cancel the whole project. There is no point in moving forward if that one single requirement would fail. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's the acid test. We stop the project if that one requirement can't be addressed. Right. Okay. And it's when I get into that sort of conversation and people say everything's a must have. I say, okay, well, let's just take that one, mm. this one by itself. Mm. If that are we saying if we didn't deliver that, there was no point in delivering anything else? And usually, yeah. you know, literally nine times out of ten, people turn around and say, well, I wouldn't cancel the project. Okay. It's not a must-have. It's have not a must-have. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. It might be really, really important, mm. yeah, but it, might, it, isn't, uh, it isn't necessarily a must-have. And what's interesting about that is, and that, that, that sort of popped up and, mm. uh, and, and, no must and dis okay. disappeared, disappeared i'll show you that again so um yeah it's perfectly okay for a project to have no must-haves at all yeah well, if, you, if you think of a a lot of projects these days are about enhancing a solution to do something different or better or whatever mm -hmm. and you look at that and say well nothing in there being a must-have is okay because you know what you're running your business at the moment mm -hmm. and you're using this mm. system at the moment mm. you know what we want to do is make a number of changes so okay. maybe no must is OK. Or you might say, well, there's no point in making these enhancements unless we can deliver this new value. Mm. Yeah. So that might identify some uh, some must haves. OK, so the should haves then are things that um, are really important. If we don't deliver these, then the business case doesn't doesn't get met. OK, yeah? so it's nothing to do with legality and safety. It's about is it worth doing? So what you usually find is there are quite a lot of should-haves. There are things that have a lot of value and what most people think we must have this, actually, they might just be really, really important should-haves mm. right at the top of that list. Yeah, And uh, and they're things that, yeah, well, OK, maybe if that one requirement wasn't met, we wouldn't have cancelled the project. But I'd be pretty upset because we're not delivering the value that we need to uh, we need to deliver from this. Okay. But ultimately, if we prioritize dynamically amongst all of these really important things, yeah, and we focus on that business need, mm -hmm. focus on the business need, focus on the business need, not the I want, mm. yeah, mm. then we end up with being able to dynamically prioritize these uh, these should have requirements. The could have requirements tend to be those things that they're nice, but the workarounds for them are easy or cheap or they don't have very much value. Okay. Yeah, sometimes people talk about bells and whistles. Oh, yeah. Right. That's a nice The extras. Caps, the extras. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what we say is, provided they have some value, we mm. should be considering those things as well. But they should be, think of them as a bonus. If you get them, that's great. If you get that that little nice thing, then that, that, will, that will be good. But it won't actually impact our business case or the viability of the project. Okay, so we mentioned earlier about this 80-20 rule that the people are aware of, yeah. but there's another rule, isn't there, the 60-20-20 rule. Can you explain about that? Because people do stumble over that one, don't they? Yeah, and that's, that's really interesting. And I, I mentioned to you, actually, that you know this, that the guidance on Moscow had evolved over time. And mm. It was actually in a previous version of, uh, of the handbook, we had an example where um, our... Uh, um, Guidance was actually suggesting that if you were to set your project up, so you had 60% must-haves um, and 20% should-haves and 20% could-haves, this is, this is how it would work. 
And people looked at that example and thought it was a rule. And, okay. it, and it, it isn't actually a rule. Mm. Um, so the 60-20-20 rule that people talk about isn't a rule at all. Um, but it is still very important to uh, to respect the sort of effort guidelines around this. This is what makes Moscow work okay. in the real world. So let's look at that. So the first thing that uh, that we need to understand is that our must-haves are guaranteed. Yeah? So if you prioritise properly, the project, uh, the project or, or the team will guarantee to deliver our must-haves. Um, and we don't mean probably, we mean absolutely guaranteed. Certainty. Yeah, with mm -hmm. certainty. Okay. Yeah, that's what we want to achieve. And we achieve that by saying that typically you shouldn't have any more than 60% of the effort of your overall requirements allocated to must-haves. 60% mm -hmm. effort, typically no more than that. Now, you could argue that if you're very familiar with the technology, you understand the requirements very well and all this sort of thing, you can up that a bit, 70% of effort. That's okay. absolutely fine. Okay. Yeah. And where you're in a situation where things are really risky or, or you don't have that level of understanding at the outset, things are much more dynamic, you might want to drop that back a bit and say maybe only 50% of effort associated uh, with um, with must-have requirements. But we'll stick with 60 for now because that's, that, that's the, the, the figure that tends to work by default. What that means is you've got 40% of the effort uh, that isn't associated with must-haves. Now, we don't guarantee that should-haves or could-haves are delivered, mm. but at the same time, there is enough effort here. You've got 40% of the total effort of the project to expect that those will be, or at least some of them will be. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, so what we have here is contingency in terms of 40% of the effort is stuff that we don't absolutely have to have, even though they're important. If okay. the solution is still legal, safe, and will work without mm -hmm. it, um, that allows us to make this guarantee. Yeah? And if you think, if you think about, uh, that's another slide later on. I talk about the numbers in a bit more detail. Okay. All right. Yeah. But to look then at the contingency, if we tip, have typically around 20% of the overall effort associated with could-haves, the things that would be a bonus if we get it, the things that uh, would be nice if they were there but won't really impact the business case in, in any significant way, then that is not expected to be delivered. It might be. If everything goes really, really well, you might get some could-haves delivered. Mm -hmm. yeah? But mm -hmm. we know the real world doesn't usually <laughs> allow for that, everything going really, really well all the time. Um, but what the business should expect yeah, is the must-haves and the should-haves to be delivered because we still have about 20% of the, the resources available on the project associated with could-haves, and that becomes our contingency. Okay. <clears throat> so talking a, a little bit, a little bit, expanding that a little bit, mm. you see that pie chart there. We've got a smaller proportion of, uh, of, of it in orange, but that's still the contingency. It's still enough contingency to have confidence that if you can't deliver everything, you can't guarantee it, but you should be able to deliver those should haves as well. So musts and shoulds should be expected at, at the end of the uh, end of the project. So if your contingency is provided by the could have requirements, mm -hmm. why is that better than just providing a couple of extra weeks of development time? Okay, and that's a, that's a another another really good question, and it comes back to oh, okay. human nature actually, and uh, and. What we've identified is that time and effort-based contingency, that extra couple of weeks at the end, mm. uh, tends to be wasteful because Parkinson's law says that work expands to fill the time available. And actually, as a, as a project manager and, and actually witnessing project managers in other organisations, in fact, there was one really good example of this where the project manager came up with a set of estimates and then wanted some contingency time, mm. you know, an extra month mm. at the end of his project. And the sponsor turned around and said, no, you're not having that contingency. Wow. And, and the, well, why is that? Why won't? Well, because if I give it to you, you will use it. Yeah. yeah that's an interesting law, isn't it, Parkinson's law? I think we can all kind of relate to that, can't we? If we have that extra time, we will use it. We will use yeah. it. Yeah. And I actually... Um, Occasionally, when I when I train roomfuls of project managers in, in this, I actually sometimes ask them, "When was the last time you didn't use all of your contingency?" Yeah, mm, and okay. and 
people have stopped and they have to think really hard looking for an example an example where they didn't use all of their contingency mm. so you can see why people will say no i don't want to give it to you because you're only going to use it yeah yeah because yeah. work does expand it to does. fill the time available and it's it's difficult to control and if you look at some of the other sort of heavyweight project management methods like prince2 or pmi or whatever then they start talking about how you should tie contingency to risk and task and do it at the task level and and you should monitor it and control it and report it and yeah right you know mm. the, that heavyweight stuff just mm. doesn't get done yeah so uh so but in theory, you should only have contingency for certain risks. Mm. In reality, what goes wrong is probably something you didn't think about in the first place. So it's uh, um, so often what people do is they take their estimates and they pad them out. So that was the sort of behavior in the, the organization that I was talking to. That's what people ended up doing. They hid the contingency. Well, I'll just add an extra 20 percent anyway. Right. Yeah. And, it's a safety uh, blanket almost. Isn't exactly. It? Yeah. And the problem is, work expanded to use that. So, mm. so surprise, surprise, they used all of that, and they still went back for more money, more money, and more time. And more time, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, what Moscow does is, it says we take, we take everything. We know what we want to do. We estimate it, yeah. And uh, and with Moscow prioritization, if we run into difficulties or challenges or something happens we don't expect, we can be completely open and honest about saying, well, this has happened. And do you know what? There's no point in getting upset about it mm. or complaining about mm. it or whatever. Mm, it's, it's a fact. It's, it's, it's fact. happened. Yeah, Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. We need to deal yeah. with it. We need to deal mm. with it. So how do we deal with it? We deal with it by taking the least important thing that's left on our backlog of work and say, we're not going to deliver that in this this time around. Mm -hmm. yeah, we turn something from a could have into a won't have effectively. Okay. What we have in Moscow prioritization, if you follow those, you know, you respect those continue, those uh, effort percentage yeah. percentages, mm -hmm. is that we have 60% of our efforts associated with must have requirements. If you think about what that means in terms of real contingency, if you had a 100 day project, 60 days are associated with your must have requirements, it gives you 40 days worth of effort that aren't. Okay. You do the maths, how much contingency is that? 40 divided by 60 is 66% contingency. Now, any project manager going along to anybody and saying, I want 66% contingency, you'd have to have a really, really yeah. good story yeah. for anybody to turn around and say, oh, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. Yeah? So that's one of the reasons why um, you always expect a lot more than just the must-haves to be delivered. And if you took the could-haves, that 20% of the effort, as being what our contingency really is, and you say, okay, well, what, what's, how does that work out in the same, same maths? Well, we've got a 100-day project, 20 days of that is our contingency. Mm. Yeah, 20 80ths, and mm -hmm. 20, 20 80ths is still 25%. 25. Yeah. So the could-haves still give you a decent amount of contingency, probably a little bit more than if you went and said, I want an extra 20% time and budget. Mm. Yeah. But what we always have here is we don't have this empty space for work to expand into because there is always the very first time something goes wrong the very first time you say oh that took us 10 days longer than we expected mm. you have to have the conversation of okay well what are we going to drop out then sure absolutely. Yeah? and that conversation really keeps people focused mm. you do that time box by time box and everything stays under control okay well let, let's talk about and um, there's another sort of term that i've heard out there scope creep for instance mm. so how does moscow deal with that in projects okay well that's all about change yes. yeah so uh, so people quite often think if something changes it's scope creep and sometimes it is right sometimes if a business if a business person comes and say well look, this has happened out in our business environment which we need means we need to add this requirement into our project mm -hmm. to meet that new need or new challenge that would genuinely be a, a scope creep so we're now wanting the system or our project something objectives extra. to do something extra yeah, sure. to what we thought um but also i see you know scope creep uh being being used for just because something was more difficult than we thought it was going to be. That's not scope creep at all. Oh, I see. Yeah, the fact okay. it took us twice as long as we expected doesn't actually alter the. We're not doing anything different. No. Yeah. That's so it not can be used creep. as an excuse then. It can be used as an excuse as right. well. Right. Okay. Absolutely. So what we need to think about is change and what the different types of change are. 
So we might have a change to the business need. And if that changes, clearly we have to accommodate that change. Otherwise, we'll build something that isn't appropriate. Yeah, won't meet the need the business has. And then it will go back to be prioritised again, won't it? Of course and it will. It Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we might, uh, it might just be a change of understanding. Mm. Oh, now we've got into this. It's a, not quite what we expected. Mm -hmm. And that can come from business people just as much as it can come from the, the people that are building a solution. Yeah, that, that level of understanding. And it might also be based on our capability to deliver. Mm. So what happens if we lose a very skilled resource from our team? Mm. Yes, exactly. You know, if we lose a resource, yeah. mm. that's, that's, that's the skill everything. and knowledge and everything mm. else has moved out, moved out the door. Mm. We've got to accommodate that. So all of these things can lead to sort of projects overrunning or costing more or whatever. But if we apply Moscow and we think about every one of the, our response to those situations um, as a, well, you know, we, this has happened, we've got this new requirement. If mm. you look at the, on the screen there, there's uh, these little boxes outside, uh, over to the, to the left of that beaker of, of uh, must, shoulds and coulds. The way we, way we work is when we plan, we plan, we fill our beaker right to the brim. So we've got must, shoulds and coulds in there. Right. Yeah? And it, there is no extra space. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what happens if there's a change and let's say a new requirement comes in and it's a must have. Mm. Yeah? Um, that new requirement, if you think about it in terms of this beaker, mm -hmm. will get dropped into the beaker. So it'll throw some of the coulds out. Exactly. Yeah. All the levels will go up. The yeah. least important thing Absolutely. is what, uh, what disappears. Mm -hmm. So that would be a business change. If something just took us more time and effort than we expected. Well, it was still a requirement. It was still important. Mm. Um, it just, the requirement became bigger in terms of effort. Mm -hmm. Guess what happens? If that's a must have or a should have, it takes up more space in the beaker. It displaces a could have. Okay. Yeah. So okay. whatever happens, whatever the change is, we, we try and deal with it by saying, okay, what's the least important thing, the least valuable thing that's left in our backlog of work that we can get rid of and still meet that business vision and the overall business objective. Okay. Okay. Understand. The key thing again, as I've said, uh, I said before, is mm. that the business has to be in the driving seat. It shouldn't be up to you know a, a t somebody in technology or IT or whatever to decide this is what I'm going to drop out. Mm. Yeah. Because as soon as as soon as the, the the business loses control over what is the most valuable thing to them, they'll lose faith in this whole process. So it's really important that that's a collaborative uh, conversation. Yeah. yeah. And what normally you find in terms of a collaborative conversation, you say, right, we need to claw back 10 days of effort for whatever reason. Mm. What we could do is we could drop this one requirement, yeah, and that would give us all the 10 days back. Or we could drop these three because there's a two, three day requirements and a two day effort requirement in there. We could drop those three. And it's up to the business to say, well, you know what? I think I'd rather drop that single requirement and have the value from those three little ones because mm -hmm. that overall is, is a, gives mm -hmm. me more, more benefit. Absolutely. So keeping the business in the driving seat is absolutely vital here. Yeah. Okay. So we had two tips so far. The first one was respect that knowledge. Mm. Uh, the, sorry, not the knowledge. Respect the, um, the definitions the yeah, of absolutely. must, should, and could. Yeah. And the second one was respect those effort estimates. Mm -hmm. The third one is to really make sure that you get everybody on board with this, in particular a sponsor. And it's all your stakeholders, isn't it? Everyone comes it together. Is. It's mm. all the stakeholders. The sponsor is actually the most important one mm. because the sponsor is the person that is funding this. Of course, they've got the money. <laughs> you know, they've got yeah. the money. Um, and when you talk to when you talk to businesses, as I and I said this before, what they really are most interested in is predictability. Mm. A business needs to know when am I going to get this thing, mm. whatever it is, mm. this capability or this product or whatever, so I can start exploiting it. Mm. Yeah, because we've got of a course, business case. They want to business. move on, don't they? Absolutely. Whether we write it all down in a business case document or whether it's just an everybody knows it, <laughs> yes. you've still got a business case that drives this. Yes. And what businesses really need is predictability. Um, and by that, I mean, in the scenario I, I explained before, where I used to turn up to a steering committee and I used to I used to say, you know, you're going to have to give me another month and a, <laughs> another extra budget to get this done or you'll have nothing. Yes. You know, I, I went into that. I don't know. And people had this strange idea. They had a choice. 
Right. They didn't. I might as well have gone in there with a gun <laughs> and said, you need to give me, you know, I'm going to take more money and more time. The from power. You. My goodness, Andrew, the power exactly. you must have felt. Because the project would have been a certain way down the Absolutely. line. Money would have been spent. And like all the project managers, you can imagine what people were muttering under I their breath. I can imagine. I can imagine. But what we get with this is a, a real choice. So that we've got the real predictability. We know we're going to deliver on time and on budget. Mm -hmm. We don't know from the outset exactly what will be delivered. But no. we know when it's going to be delivered. Absolutely. We know it will meet the overall objective. Mm -hmm. And we know how much it's going to cost us. And the re what I would do going into the same sort of steering committee or project board, I'd go in and say, OK, guys, we've got this for you. Mm. It's good to go. Mm. It will work. It will do most of what you need. But it hasn't got these things in it. If you'd like to give me some more time and more budget, we can build those things into it. But it's a real choice. You choose to do that. Yes. And actually, that very first project that um, that I ran at British Airways, where we used Moscow prioritization, um, we only delivered the must-haves and half the should-haves. That's all we delivered. Wow. And the the sponsor and the, the business visionary for the, for the project actually at the end of that was really pleased he, he wrote to my boss and my boss's boss and said this dsdm thing's fantastic i want it used on all the projects in my area from now on fantastic and that was really good but i thought but we only yeah we, we only didn't deliver about three everything. quarters of what yeah. you wanted yeah. so i said to him afterwards that was that's really great pete but why are you so pleased because there's a whole load of important stuff here we didn't deliver and he said yeah but it's the first time you lot, meaning IT, <laughs> it's the first time you lot have ever delivered anything when you said you were going to deliver it. Wow. Yeah. So that was groundbreaking to him it then, was, wasn't it? It was absolutely groundbreaking. Mm. And I can take it away and I can use it. And by the way, I've been working with IT for 13 years, and this is the first time it's happened. Wow. You know, And so you can see why businesses really get pleased about mm. this. It's because, and he was in control all the way through. Mm. And I said to him, okay, well, you know, we, there were some things here we should have so that we didn't get done. Do you want to? Do you want us to do a? Do you want to approve some more expenditures to, to do that? He said yes, but not yet, right. because I've got this really important thing I want you to do first. Yes, fair yeah? enough. New a new so project. He was prioritizing, wasn't he? he? He was prioritizing. Absolutely. A new project. I want you to get on with that. Yeah. Once you've done that, then we'll come back come to back this. To it. Mm. And what was really interesting, actually, that was a project that lasted another six months. <laughs> that second project. And I came back to him and said, OK, that's done now. And by the way, we delivered all the must and the shoulds for that second project. Um, <laughs> but we went him and said, OK, so these things that, uh, that we didn't get delivered then, what, what would you like to do about that? And he said, well, do you know what? This one here, I thought people would be really upset that, that mm. that facility wasn't available in this system. Nobody's even mentioned it it's to me. It's been tested and it's working. And yeah, yeah. Nobody wants that feature. No, fair enough. So we can forget that one. Yeah. This one here, I, you know, I, hardly a day goes by without people coming in the office and complaining that they can't do this. So I've got to have that. That, that needs to be done. Um, this one, this other one, actually, there's a change coming up with the trade unions, and mm. that might change. That requirement might change anyway. So we can leave that one and cut a long and story short. On, there was one. There was one of those requirements that was needed. So mm. it wasn't a project at all. It was a oh. minor enhancement. It got done. He was happy. Yeah. All the way through, it's about. It's about choice and the key thing talking to business people selling this approach to the business is your choice business people not the project manager not the project management office not the it guys okay yeah and okay. and i quoted captain peter larratt uh, there at the bottom it's the first time you lot <laughs> ever delivered what i needed when you promised you lot you probably needed that in capitals and yeah. underlined and bold pretty much <laughs> exactly. didn't you the way he said it <laughs> exactly and that's the other thing it became his project yes yeah. Yeah. He took he ownership. Was, he Absolutely. was owning it. He yeah. was involved with it and engaged with it. It was his project. But what a huge shift for him to experience as well. Absolutely. I mean, a huge, huge shift because you said he'd been there for what thirteen years, yeah. and and suddenly things were being delivered on time and in working capacity. I mm. mean, he must have been a very happy man. I, yeah. I mean, no wonder he, you know he was shouting from the rooftops and dancing yeah. around. Like, Absolutely. Just, just envisage it. Absolutely. And, okay. and the, the really interesting thing as well, it's not in the it's not in the slide deck, but what we what we found when we introduced this this combination of Moscow and time boxing is that we ended up also with a 25 percent, at least 25 percent uplift in productivity. Yeah. Across across the whole of the um, IT department in terms mm. of their projects. And that wasn't even with all the projects using using DSDM. Mm. It was absolutely staggering. And I guess yeah. you can put that down to people feeling justified and happy 
and you know that they're being productive and things are working well and yep. people are just uniting really in that Abs- we can do this absolutely. we've achieved absolutely. which always makes people feel good and happy workers yeah. happy productivity really and that makes really, sense and that is all about that fourth tip that yes. i just put up mm. a whole business focus not mm. the not the individual need but the, the whole business and understanding of everybody that comes from the debate and the conversation about those priorities mm. yeah the, the common sense overriding the the sort of individuals banging the table and saying they want things. Yeah, the ability to think things through, collaborating, getting everybody on board. And as you said, that's where the smiles and yeah. the, the feeling of our project Absolutely. And, and comes from. And that that in it, that alone, that sort of mood, that feeling improves productivity. Being realistic, having that conversation, and ultimately being predictable. And that was what the first time you lot ever delivered something when you promised. <laughs> you know, and it meets my need. Yes. And no, none of the me, 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 now, 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 you know, and I, I've seen, I've, honestly, I, there's one particular organisation who I won't name that I've worked with, and they they just thought it was all about the macho standing up and shouting and banging command the table. Command control kind of thing. Well, it was command. There yeah, was, no, con- there was so. no control. Well, fair enough. You know, yeah, and it, it's, it's you, would, you would say, well, you know, what you're asking to do can't be done in this time frame. Well, you'll just have to do it. Mm, that's their form of control. Yeah, but that's it? their form of control. <laughs> yeah. it's, just, it's just stupid bullying. It is. It is. Know? It's crazy. And what we need is that collaborative effort, the we rather than the me, yes. and the as soon as we can mm. rather than the now. Mm. Yeah. So that's. Mm. Uh, yeah. So but like you say, everybody on the same page, working together, can achieve amazing things. Yeah. And that's always going to be the same. I mean, that's, that's, that's human nature in a way as well, isn't it? Absolutely. So that was a huge paradigm shift to experience, I would have thought, and work through back in the early 90s. So, Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Well, long, long may that continue, really, mm. because that is the way forward. Well, and that's, that's, a lot of that comes into the culture and leadership of today that we talk about as well through the consortium, doesn't it? Absolutely. In terms of how, how to treat, especially in the leadership side of things, how to treat your employees, how to make them feel, how to make them feel that they're, they're part of something that you can all move on together mm. and stakeholders are on, all on the same page. So, I mean, that's, that's yeah, it's, it's huge for today as well. And one of those things that, that it, I haven't put it as a tip, but I kept putting that little logo up, business in the driving seat. Yeah, that is where real control is. Mm. Yeah, it's mm. not about the banging the desk and the shouting. It's about no. actually participating and being in control that way. Okay, well that, that gets to me gets me to the end of what I was in what I was intending to say. Okay, so now we have a time for questions. Um, we're going to have to go back to um, one of our previous slides when you were talking about the. Let's think. What was it? It was the could have been the project variables actually, Andrew, um, mm-hmm. or the scope based contingency. We um, we've had a question through. Like, when you say stop the project, um, and this was very much when I think none of the musts were fitting, um, yeah. wasn't it? Um, it was going. Does stop mean stop stop? Or does it just mean pause and resolve and, oh, and right. look at it yes. again? Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you can help us with that one, that would be great. Yeah. So so when I was when I was talking about that um, earlier on, it was really when we were in that sort of planning phase, when, mm. when we're when we're just initiating the project. So we haven't actually started building anything yet. And I think the, the I was using I was using that as a, uh, and it typically is exactly as uh, as. Um, uh, as Matthew says uh, here, it is about the pause and, and resolve, actually. Mm. And the resolution is coming to the realisation that it isn't actually a must-have. Mm. It's, it's a should-have. It's down the line. And saying, mm. you know, OK, well, if it's a should-have, that's fantastic. We can deal with it. We can prioritise it. Or more to the point, you can deal with it and mm. you can prioritise it. Mm. Yeah. So, so, yes, it's usually a, um, a, a pause and, and resolve in, in reality. Okay. All right. We've had another question through um, from Bill. Um, Thank you for your question, Bill. Um, And thank you for listening to the webinar as well. It's great to have you with us today. He said, do you think that Moscow can also work with the concept of a fixed budget instead of a fixed time frame as per the norm? I.e. when not going over the budget is more critical than over time. I've heard of Agile PM trainer mention this as a possibility to his delegates, even though not in the book. Yeah, so, so if effectively, um, the, the key thing about going, going back to that triangle, mm. um, the key thing is not trying to nail down all points of the triangle. And, and, and this, this actually is, is reasonably common, uh, this idea that, you know, there are certain things that are most important to us. And if it takes a bit longer, we don't care, as long as it doesn't cost us any more, is mm. one. Mm. Um, so taking that, taking that, uh, 
example, absolutely. Yeah. So what you what you would be doing there is you would be you'd be looking at the effort and you'd be looking at what the cost is associated with that effort. Mm -hmm. And you say, right, these are the things we, we, we must do. Therefore, we must spend money on the things we should spend money on, the things we could spend money on. And you control in that way. And if you find that, you know, your uh, your budget is being used up, your cash is being used up, you say, okay, well, we can no longer fit those could haves in then with the amount of, of, of budget we have left. So absolutely, you can uh, you can use it in, in that way. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Bill, for your question. And Matthew, thank you also for um, putting the question forward. They seem to be coming through thick and fast at the moment. So uh, it, we'll try and get through as many as we can, but we're almost coming up to the hour. Um, so the next question then. Um, in our team, we have really short time boxes, only two weeks, including the Q&A process. How can we fix Moscow into this short delivery time frame? Okay. So, so that's a, so that's a, a, a really... A really good question as well. I mentioned that you can use Moscow in different time frames. Yeah. So mm. um, it's, I, I'm not sure uh, whether we've got a, in this we have a two week time box and then it goes live. That that might be the case, um, or whether it's just uh, we work in time boxes and maybe maybe we'll have a number of time boxes before we go live. Let's assume that it's a two week time box and then we're going to go live and we're going to have our QA process involved in that and the QA is getting us to the point where we can go live. Um, with that one, it's quite tricky. What you have to probably do is break down a requirement into, into sub requirements. Okay. So you'd actually say we might have a, a requirement that in this two week sprint, we need to deliver this new capability. Mm -hmm. It's worth digging into that and saying, okay, well, to deliver that capability, what must, should, could we do to make that a reality? Right. Yeah, so, okay. so you can then say, okay, well, we, we, uh, an, an example might be, um, I don't know. Let's let's say something simple like like a, a, an address, entering an address into a website or something like mm -hmm. that. You'd say, well, ideally, what we want to be able to do is just to put a postal code in and, and click a button that says, "Look up my address." Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, um, these days it'd be off the shelf functionality. But if we were <laughs> if we were to have to write that functionality, that's right. probably quite a complex thing to do. Sure. Yeah. So you might say, well, do we want to? Would we take that all the way down to? The street level mm. yeah so which is what most websites do these days you put in your postal code you'll you click on your, your your find my address and you get a number of options and you select one of them okay you might say actually well maybe if we just took it down to the town oh, yeah? I see. so yeah. so you you would actually take the uh, some sort of postal postal code that would, would give you a town only and mm -hmm. then you could do so you'd need to actually put in I don't know the number of your house or your apartment and the road it's on. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. that would be that would still be better. That it wouldn't be the full thing, no, but sure. it would be better. And as an absolute minimum, you'd have to type in your whole address. Right. Yeah, so that the must have is somehow we get the address in here, and if that means everybody has to type it all the way in, that would be our must have. So if you had that, okay. you know, enter address or, or mm. get the address in in somehow, you could say, right, well, we must achieve that as a minimum. We could get everything fully automated and maybe we can prioritize and they should have the things within that that would uh, uh, that would, would work for us it can be a bit tricky but it's worth thinking about it in that way okay and it's also about bringing the team on board the stakeholders on board to, to talk to them about that process as well. absolutely mm. absolutely right yeah mm. business in the driving seat and, and and that conversation is, you know it could be a we we could do this but that's a lot of work mm. you know that's the only thing we'd be able to do in this sprint mm. if that's what we did absolutely. but if we took it to this slightly lower level then we could fit these two things in as well would that be more valuable yeah collaboration communication it's vital isn't it mm. it really is well, thank you for those questions. Um, we, um, Andrew, we're going to keep the discussions open. So if, if more people are going to send through questions, and I see there's a few more that we haven't quite got to yet, but mm. we really are running out of time. Um, would you be happy to put some short answers together and maybe send them out on an email when we do the follow-up email with the slides? That would be yeah. wonderful. No thank problem. Um, and I've actually put my uh, put my uh, email address on the uh, on on the uh, yes, the, the last slide. That's wonderful. So if, if anybody has any of those. Uh, those little questions, then uh, then please feel free to, uh, Perfect. to send me an email. Brilliant. Well, we're just up to the hour. So thank you very much for joining us today on the webinar series for All About Moscow. Andrew, really much appreciated. My pleasure. Um, and like I said, we're going to keep those discussions open. So if there's more questions to come through, please send them through to us. That would be fantastic. Um, yes, our next webinar is going to be um, 
on uh, 11 a.m. on Thursday the 5th of July and I'm delighted that uh, we have an amazing new product here at the Agile Business Consortium which is the Agile Digital Services or Agile DS as its working title will be. Um, and my guest speaker um, that's going to be joining me on that Thursday is going to be Peter Stansbury and he's the lead author who's actually um, written and compiled with the team um, the book um, the handbook for um, Ag um, Agile DS. Um, it's actually a product, it's going through certification, APMG are accrediting it, and it's going to be, I think, live right at the end of the year, or, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right, isn't it? We're just it's, about... it's, it's going to be available in quarter three, that's so, right. so probably that's all, right. August time for people yes. to use, um, and it'll be fully live uh, right at the end of the year. And we're just about to go into public beta in the next that's few right. months, aren't we? So it's very exciting times with Ag Agile uh, Digital Services. There was a real need, I think, um, working and looking at the GDS life cycle to, um, to parallel it in a way, I think, with um, Agile PM. And Agile Digital Services has really been able to bridge the gap between the two, hasn't it? Absolutely. P Peter has years of experience working in, inside government with, with IT and, uh, and is also sort of a, 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 a practitioner and a trainer in, in, in our Agile products. So yeah, bringing indeed. those two together, that's fantastic. Yes, absolutely. It's a really good product too. It is. It's fantastic. And it's getting amazing reviews when people are going through the process of the alpha and beta as well. So, yeah, please join me for that one on 11 a.m. on Thursday, the 5th of July. But for now, uh, we are up to that hour. And thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Really appreciate your time. Keep listening to our um, resources um, and our webinar series that we do. We've got some really exciting um, other guest speakers coming up throughout the year. So um, it's wonderful to have you there. Any questions, please come through to me and send them through to my email. Um, I'm always happy to uh, talk directly to people. So you've got my email address there. And as Andrew said, obviously, he had his email there too as well. So no problem at all with uh, keeping discussions open. But for now, thank you very much for joining us. And we'll be speaking to you again very soon. Bye-bye for now. Bye for now.